بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to this special edition of Seeking Shade we wanted to thank you guys for joining us on this beautiful night mashallah in order to continue this beautiful night we would like to start with Quran recitation and inshallah we have our brother Amin to do that أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولله ملك السماوات والأرض والله على كل شيء قدير إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار واختلاف الليل والنهار واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لأولي الألباب الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار ربنا إنك من تدخل النار فقد أخزيته وما للظالمين من أنصار ربنا إننا سمعنا مناديا ينادي للإيمان ربنا إننا سمعنا مناديا ينادي للإيمان أن آمنوا بربكم فآمنا ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تخزنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد صدق الله العظيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I want us to take a little journey back to a very particular specific moment in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we know at the age of 40, was given the mission of preaching and teaching Islam to all of humanity. That fateful night in the cave of Hira, when the Archangel Gabriel, when Jibreel Alayhi Salam came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and brought to him the words of Allah, Kalamullah, Iqra Bismi Rabbika Ladi Khalaq. And the Prophet was given the responsibility of teaching and preaching this message to all of humanity. Wa andir ashira takalakarabin, starting with his own family members and the people of his tribe. And ultimately, Wa ma'ar salnaka illa kafatalin nasi bashira wa nadira that you have to take this message to all of humanity. And the Prophet ﷺ spared no effort in doing that. For the next decade, he sacrificed, he toiled, he strove, he sweat, he bled, he cried. He did everything and then more. And after 10 years, a decade of doing this, the Prophet ﷺ, who was no stranger to adversity, trial, tribulation, that's what we're talking about here today. 
difficulty, adversity, trial, tribulation, tragedy. The Prophet ﷺ was no stranger to this. His father passed away just a couple of months before he was born while his mother was pregnant with him. His mother passes away when he's only six years old. His grandfather dies when he's eight. He has no biological siblings. He was the first child of his parents. He's raised by his uncle. And he grows up in a very difficult time where he is created by Allah to be the messenger of God, to be the messenger of Allah. And he's living in this mushrik pagan society. It was very difficult. So then at the age of 40, when he receives revelation, the mission, he sacrifices so much. But then 10 years later, he is dealt the greatest tragedies of his life. His wife, the mother of his children, his partner in life for 25 years. The first one who accepted and believed in his message. Excuse me, sorry. The first one who accepted and believed in his message. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. She passed away. He lost her. And in losing her, again, to state the obvious, he lost his wife. His children lost their mother. He lost the first believer, his strongest supporter. All of that. And try to, you know, I, I talk about this often that a lot of times when we discuss the seerah, the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi to Rasul, we a lot of times just talk about it because it's a history book. You read it, you turn the page. But try to understand Try to feel what that must have been like. To wake up one morning and the person that's been next to you for 25 years is no longer there. The first person you spoke to every day and the last person you spoke to every night is gone. How difficult and tragic that must have been. Especially for someone in, I'm sorry. Especially for someone in his position. How difficult that must have been to lose that. Because what happens when we deal with a lot of difficulty outside, what do we do? You go home. You talk to your family. You talk to your spouse. For the young ones, you talk to your parents. When your kids are older, you even discuss it with your children. But you talk to your family. And now the Prophet him dealing with all the difficulty, the dhulm, the oppression, the mu'anada, all of that from the people of Mecca. And the person that he would talk to when he went home is not there. But then three weeks later, three weeks after Khadija radiallahu anha passed away, the Prophet ﷺ was dealt with another tragedy of equal proportion. His uncle Abu Talib passed away. Now, when I say uncle, right, that means something different to everyone. This is not just the kind of uncle that, you know, you see once a month or a few times a year. No, no, Abu Talib was the one who raised the Prophet ﷺ from the age of eight. When the Prophet ﷺ wanted to get a job for the very first time, he spoke to Abu Talib. When he was starting a business, he spoke to Abu Talib. When he got his marriage proposal, he spoke to Abu Talib. That's like your parents, Right? When a young person wants to get a job or start a business or gets a marriage proposal, who do they talk to? They talk to their parents. Abu Talib was like the parent of the Prophet ﷺ. He raised him. He was his family. So for 40 years, your primary family member, and he loses him three weeks later. 
He lost the two most important people in his entire life three weeks apart. And not only that, but Abu Talib's passing had another tragedy inside of it. Musibah tunfi musibah. And what was the tragedy? That Abu Talib had not said La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah yet. Someone came and told the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Talib was very elderly and he was already kind of sick. He was on his deathbed. But somebody came and got the Prophet ﷺ. You need to rush now. You need to come now. So the Prophet ﷺ rushed to the bedside of Abu Talib. He sat down next to him, holding his hand, whispering in his ear, Kalimatun, Ya Ammi, Kalimatun, Uhadju laka biha inda Allah. Uncle, please, say the words so that I can testify on your behalf on the day of judgment. That, ya Rabb, Ya Allah, I heard him say it. He said it. Qalaha. Wa ana shahidun lahu. I heard it. I will testify. And already in the room, Abu Jahal and these kinds of people, Abu Lahab, Abu Jahal, they were gathered in the room and they saw that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is trying to make Abu Talib say his words. So they started screaming and shouting. Ala dini Abdul Muttalib. Ala dini abaika. Dini Abdul Muttalib. They said, don't forget the religion of your forefathers. They're shouting. And finally, Abu Talib, he's dying. He says to the Prophet ﷺ, he says, nephew. Nephew. I cannot give you what you ask me for. And then he says, Ala dini Abdul Muttalib. And he passed away. He didn't read the kalima. And the Prophet ﷺ was so devastated. Devastated. You know, there's a powerful connection that many people in our community find in this example of the Prophet ﷺ. I have a friend, a personal friend. And he accepted Islam when we were young, when we were teenagers. And we grew up together from that point. One of my closest friends. And a few years back, I still remember where I was. I was out of town doing a program in Boston. And I finished the program. It was a night program like this. And we were going for dinner with a couple of friends. And I got a call. And I always answer when he calls. So I said, give me a moment. I answered the call. And I remember he gave me the news that his mother had just passed away. And he tried for years, for decades. And even in the very last moments, he was with her. But she did not say the kalima. And he has not recovered till today. He still grieves. He won't come to town. He moved away. He said, I can't be here. It breaks my heart every day. It breaks my heart. He messaged me a few weeks ago and my father was in a hospital a month or so ago and I wasn't able to see him. Um, but he came into town for like half a day because he had some kind of legal thing to take care of and he left the same day. I beg him, come visit me. Habibi, friend, please come visit me. Come see me. But he just can't. SubhanAllah, the pain is so profound. The Prophet ﷺ felt that pain for Abu Talib. So much so that Allah had to console him. إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهِ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ 
You cannot guide whom you have loved. We, a lot of times people translate this ayah, بعض الناس يترجمون هذه الآية they translate this ayah بأن هذا زجر للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لا هذا تسلية للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم this is not Allah reprimanding the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم you can't guide whom you love no 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 this is Allah comforting and consoling the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم because the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم started questioning himself what more could I have done what else should I have said you know how you second guess yourself? Maybe I should have done this. Maybe I should have done that. I could have done this. I could have done that. Allah said no. There was nothing more you could do. You did everything. And then some. There was nothing you could do. Because guidance is not in your hands. It is the decision of Allah. Allah guides whomsoever He wills. Think about it. The pain of the Prophet ﷺ at the death of Abu Talib was so profound that the day Abu Talib died, a decade later, when the Prophet ﷺ came back to Mecca for Fatshu Mecca, the conquest of Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ was sitting in the Haram near the Kaaba and he saw through the door Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu came in the door. And with Abu Bakr, he was holding the hand, was Abu Bakr's father, Abu Quhafa, who was blind. And he was very elderly. The narration says that he was so elderly that all of his hair was white. His hair, his beard, his eyebrows, everything had gone white. And he's bringing his father, Abu Quhafa. And when the Prophet ﷺ saw this, he stood up. And he says to Abu Bakr, Why did you not leave uncle at home comfortably? I would have come to see him. Why did you trouble him? And he says, No, Ya Rasulullah, he wanted to come to you. They sat down. And then he said, he wants to accept Islam. The Prophet ﷺ, he took Abu Quhafa's hand in his hand. And he gave him the shahada. And when he gave him the shahada, the Prophet ﷺ looked over at Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, wa huwa yabki buka'an shadida. He was crying so severely. And the Prophet ﷺ asked him, these are tears of joy? Tears of joy? Happiness makes you cry? And Abu Bakr said, no, tears of sadness. Huzn. Why are you sad? Your father is becoming Muslim. Why would you be sad? And Abu Bakr anhu says, Ya Rasulullah, because I still remember the look on your face the day Abu Talib died. I can never forget that. I felt your pain. And I couldn't help but think about that moment. And if I could switch places between my father and Abu Talib, I would do that in a heartbeat. That shows the love Abu Bakr had for the Prophet ﷺ. But it also tells you the pain of the Prophet ﷺ at the death of Abu Talib was so severe that a decade later the Sahaba had not forgotten the pain of the Prophet ﷺ. Difficulty upon difficulty upon difficulty. Tragedy upon tragedy upon tragedy. It doesn't even end there. After Abu Talib died, because you have to understand who Abu Talib was. Abu Talib was like the mayor of Mecca. He was the chief of Quraysh. He was the leader of Banu Hashim. And so he was respected. Whatever he said was the law. And Abu Talib had said, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is off limits. 
You do not put your hands on my nephew. So, uh, there were still a few occasions where someone had assaulted him and attacked him, but for the most part, they couldn't try to kill the Prophet ﷺ. The narration mentions a few days after the death of Abu Talib, the Prophet ﷺ, he goes outside. He goes to the marketplace. And a young man, like just a young, you know, troublemaker from the streets, walks up to the Prophet ﷺ and grabs his shirt from here. أَخَذَهُ بِجَيْبِهِ And then he says to the Prophet ﷺ that Abu Talib is dead. Who's going to keep us away now? And of course the answer is Allah, but you see, they became audacious after Abu Talib's death. So the Prophet ﷺ said, I have to think about somewhere outside of Mecca. So what did he do? The next obvious choice was a Ta'if. Because Ta'if was the second largest city in Arabia after Mecca. And it had the second largest tribe, Hawaz, uh, uh, Banu Thaqif. So the Prophet ﷺ went to Ta'if. That's a very long story. That's a different session in of itself. But we know what happened. He went there to preach. They rejected him. And when he tried to leave, they sent all the troublemakers and the criminals after him. And they threw rocks at him. They stoned him. All the way from Ta'if, إِلَىٰ قَرْنِ الثَّعَالِبِ أَوْ قَرْنِ الْمَنَازِلِ Which, if you measured the distance between those two points, it's three miles. For three miles, hundreds of people threw rocks at him. That when they finally left him and he sat down, he was bleeding. They were aiming for his legs and his feet because they didn't want to kill him. That would start a war. That his legs and his feet were bleeding so much that his sandals, leather sandals became soaked with blood and the blood dried and they became glued to his feet. Zayd bin Haritha who was with him, he had to rip the sandals off of his feet. And he had lost so much blood that he, he made dua. He prayed for the guidance of these people. But then he passed out. He became unconscious. So this is what he dealt with. So tragedy upon tragedy upon tragedy and then this kind of hardship. Think about what he's dealing with. Everything he's going through. How do you survive that? The, the question of the discussion is how do you keep your faith? How do you keep your faith? How do you remain faithful? How do you maintain your iman? How do you protect your heart? Sure. Yes. Okay. It's not the mic's fault. I, I'm pretty sure it's my fault. I've never gotten along with microphones because I don't know how to speak like normal people. So I yell and I scream and I jump around and I move my hands and then I like, you know, it's always just animated, right? Um, so as I was saying, how do you maintain and keep your iman? Keep your faith, not lose your mind, your heart, when you go through so much difficulty and adversity. How? How's that possible? The Prophet ﷺ is the ultimate exemplar. The ultimate exemplar.
The best example, Uswatun Hasana. The Prophet said, لَقَدْ أُخِفْتُ فِي اللَّهِ مَا لَمْ يُخَفْ أَحَدٍ وَلَقَدْ أُوذِيتُ فِي اللَّهِ مَا لَمْ يُؤْذَ أَحَدٍ I was threatened for Allah more than anyone before me. And I was attacked for Allah more than anyone before me. وَلَقَدْ أَتَتَ عَلَيَّ ثَلَاثُونَ مِنْ بَيْنِ يَوْمٍ وَلَيْلَةٍ وَمَالِي وَلِبِلَالٍ يَأْكُلُهُ ذُو كَبَدٍ إِلَّا مَا يُوَارِهِ إِبْتُ بِلَالٍ And he said, 30 consecutive days and nights passed. A whole month I lived. And me and Bilal had nothing to eat that would be enough for a human being to eat except for a couple of dates that Bilal used to hide in his clothes. Bilal would come across two, three, four dates and he would hide him in his pocket. You know why he would hide him? Because if the Prophet saw it, he'd give it away to other people. So to feed the Prophet he used to hide food from the Prophet And the Prophet said, I lived a whole month this way. One time Fatima, Az Zahra, Bintu Rasulullah Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet the apple of his eye. She came over to the Prophet Ali ibn Abi Talib, her husband, brought some flour. She made a small loaf of bread. Like we would, what we would call like one or two rolls. But it was fresh. So she comes to the house of the Prophet and she sits down and she opens it up and the Prophet asked her, what's the special occasion? And she said nothing. But she said that I made this fresh and so I wanted to share it with you. So the Prophet said, Bismillah, he took a piece of the bread, he ate it. He said, Alhamdulillah. And then he said, Wallahi, هذا أول طعام أكله أبوك منذ ثلاثة أيام. That I swear to God, this is the first piece of food, first morsel of food. Your father, he said to Fatima, your father himself, that I have eaten in three days. So much hardship. But how do you not break? How do you not lose the faith? So the example, and that example of the Prophet ﷺ is, after all of this tragedy, the death of Khadija, the death of Abu Talib, the brutality at Ta'if, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called the Prophet ﷺ, took the Prophet ﷺ on the most miraculous journey any human being has ever taken. The journey of al-Isra wal-Mi'raj. The journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj is a very lengthy narration that deserves its own discussion. But this is the part I want to focus on. After he was taken from Mecca to Al Quds in the night, and there from Masjid Al Aqsa, he, Urijabihi, he ascended, left this worldly realm, and went into the heavens. And there he crossed through, went through all the stages, seven stages of the heavens. And he met the Anbiya and the Rusul, the Prophets and the Messengers. And the angels greeted him. Marhaban bin Nabi Salih. They greeted him and they welcomed him. And then he went beyond all of this. And he said, I got to a place. وَسَمِعَتُ صَرِيفَ الْأَقْلَامِ I could hear the pens of destiny writing the destiny of humanity. And then Jibreel, who had been with me on this entire journey from Mecca, he stopped. So I looked, I said, why are you stopping? And he said, no, this is Sidratul Muntaha. And only you will go forward from here. I cannot proceed forward. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I went forward and I fell into sujood. 
and I was in the presence of my Lord. Closer to Allah than any creation has ever been. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said that when a person does sujood, when they do sajda, when they put their face on the ground, their head, fi qadamay ar rahman aqrabu ma yakunu al-abdu min rabbihi wa huwa sajid. Their head is in the feet of ar rahman The closest a person is to Allah is when they are in sujood. And then he praised and he glorified Allah. And then Allah gave him the gift of the five times daily prayer. That's the answer. We keep thinking that, okay, I'm going through difficulty and adversity and I need to find peace and tranquility and iman. I need to get to the point of being able to make dua to Allah and worship Allah and talk to Allah and connect with Allah. We think that's the destination. How can I get there? That is the path. The only way to overcome adversity is to turn to Allah. Who's the one who answers the call of the distressed when we cry in the middle of the night and we scream and we say, Ya Allah, Ya Rabb, please help me. Who's the one who removes the difficulty from us? It is Allah. Right? When difficulty and adversity comes upon us, If difficulty and adversity comes upon us, it is only Allah who can remove it from us. Whoever connects with Allah, Allah will make a way out for them. Allah taught us through the example of the Prophet Is your heart broken? Are you tired, exhausted, defeated, feeling down? The weight of the world is weighing on you, wearing you out. Lighten your burden. Bring peace and tranquility to your heart by turning to Allah. By putting your hands out in front of Allah. By putting your head on the ground and saying, I surrender to you, O Allah. When we read Surah Al-Fatiha, that's exactly what Allah responds. The Hadith of Bukhari, the Hadith Qudsi, إِذَا قَالَ الْعَبْدُ الْحَمْدُ اللَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَى حَمَدَنِي عَبْدِي وَإِذَا قَالَ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ قَالَ تَعَلَى أَثْنَى عَلَيَّ عَبْدِي وَإِذَا قَالَ مَالِكِ يَوْمِ الدِّينِ قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فَوَّضَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي مَجَّدَنِي عَبْدِي فَوَّضَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي My slave has surrendered himself to me. My slave has delegated فَوَّضَ تفويد. My slave has delegated everything to me. وَلِعَبْدِي مَا سَأَلْ And I will take care of my servant. My servant has surrendered delegated everything to me. So Allah, you take it from here. And Allah says, and I'll take care of everything. This is between me and my servant and I'll take care of him. That's what the way out of difficulty is. And a lot of times, it's in our nature. Human beings, Creatures, as human be as this creature, the human being, is a very Allah tells us in the Quran, right? Ajula, Daifa, Zaluman, Jahula. Allah tells us that the Halua, Jazua, Manua, the human being is very impatient. The human being is weak. The human being is oppressive. The human being is ignorant. The human being is very anxious. The human being is very nervous. Paranoid. Allah describes that. Meaning the human being has a tendency to be all these things. So sometimes we're very small minded. And even when we're looking for a solution, we, keep, we get bored very easily. 
people come all the time. What's a special dua I can read? I said, brother, if it was so special, everybody would read it. Right? Everyone's looking for something remarkable. Something magical. But the best solutions are often very straightforward and simple. The Prophet ﷺ taught us, As-salatu mi'rajul mu'min. The salah is the mi'raj, is the ascension of the believer. When you stand up and you pray in front of Allah, when you talk to Allah, the mercy of Allah sh- falls upon you. That nazalat alayhim sakina when people gather in the masjid in the house of Allah, remembering Allah, then what happens? Nazalat alayhim sakina tranquility descends on them. Ghashiyatum rahma mercy covers them. وَحَفَّتْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ The angels surround them. وَذَكَرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنْ عِنْدَهِ And Allah mentions, brags about them to the angels. So, this salah that we have taken for granted, that we don't value, this opportunity to talk to our Lord, this is a very, very powerful, Beautiful, life-changing experience. Now here's the thing. This discussion and conversation leads to the one point and that always is that, brother, I've been praying for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years I have yet to experience this power, this peace, this tranquility, serenity, calm, strength, faith that you're talking about. And it's got a very simple answer. And that is that if you use a screwdriver to try to hammer a nail and then use a hammer to try to screw in the screw and you went to the Home Depot and bought the best tools they have there, the best quality brand that there is, and you come home and you're trying to screw with a hammer and trying to nail in nails with a screwdriver and you say it doesn't work you said this company's great it's trash look at this my screwdriver is broken and my hammer is useless i gave a very silly example the obvious answer is going to be you're going to say well you're doing it all wrong you're doing it all wrong You're not applying it properly. It's not the tool's fault, it's your fault. And that's the answer for me with my salah. If my salah isn't working for me, quote unquote, it's not working for me, the problem's not with the salah. The problem's with me. I'm doing it all wrong. I need to change my perspective. I need to understand how I can do this better. And there's a longer discussion that we can have about how we can improve our salah. But I'm going to conclude by mentioning three very simple things. Number one is there's a chapter in the famous hadith compilation of Imam Abu Dawood as sijistani which is referred to as Sunan Abi Dawood, in which... There's a chapter, Babu Ihtimam in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Abis Salah. Kana Yahtamu Bis Salah. Wa Kana Yu'iddu Li Salatihi. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to prepare for his salah. Anything that you do, if you do it with preparation, it goes very well. Right? This beautiful setup. This took preparation. So anything worthwhile, anything good, 
requires some preparation. How do I prepare for my salah? The Prophet ﷺ, that chapter mentions, when he would go to pray, he would put on nice clothes. He would get up, he would go and start preparing before the prayer, early. He would use the restroom. He would make wudu, wash and clean himself. He would brush his hair and comb his beard. He would put on nice clothes. And then he would go to the masjid before the salah. And he would go and he would pray tahiyyatul masjid or any sunnah. And then he would sit for a few moments and make the dhikr of Allah. And then when he stood up to pray, now you're dialed in and connected. But what I do, what many people do, the mistake we make, is I'm sitting there on my phone, and then it's like, oh, salah? Yeah. Allahu Akbar. Now my mind is somewhere else. I'm distracted. That's not the approach. I'm watching TV. While I'm watching TV, it's like one minute, one minute, one minute, one minute, one minute, one minute, two minutes, two minutes. And then I'll just mute it, and then I'll say, Allahu Akbar. And then I'm looking from the corner of my eye. Right? Did the game start again? There's no preparation. Prepare for salah. Give it its respect. Al-ihtimam. If you have a guest coming, a very special guest, right? If Sheikh Nu'man is visiting my home, think about the preparation I make. What are we going to make? Prepare the food from before. Set it up nicely. Invite over a couple of friends. al So I'm about to go and talk to my Rabb and there's no ihtimam. There's no preparation. Ibn Kathir rahimullah ta'ala fi tafsir al-ayah al-ladhina hum fi salatihim khashi'un He said, al-khushu'u yuhsalu liman farraqa qalbahu lis-salah. Khushu'u will be attained by the person who empties their heart and their mind for the salah. Sit for 30 seconds, quietly. No phone, no nothing, no distractions. Empty your mind, empty your thoughts, and then pray. Number two is learn how to offer the prayer properly. The fiqh, the procedure of the salah, the process of the salah. There's an authentic narration a man came in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ and he prayed and he was leaving. The Prophet ﷺ was sitting at the back of the masjid and he was watching him. And when he was leaving, he said, Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Wa alaikum as salam, irji'a fa salli, fa inna kalam tu salli. He went and he prayed again, leaving again. Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah. He said, Wa alaikum as salam, irji'a fa salli, fa inna kalam tu salli. Go back and pray. You haven't prayed. It's the messenger of Allah. You don't argue. He went back and he prayed again. He's leaving again. And he says, Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah. Question mark. And the Prophet sallallahu said, Wa alaikum assalam. Irja fa salli fa lam tu salli. Go back and pray again. And then the man says, Alimni ya salah ya Rasulullah. Ya Rasul, O messenger of God, please teach me how to pray. Properly. And then the Prophet ﷺ taught him the prayer. And he specifically focused on the physical. ثُمَّ قُمْ ثُمَّ تَقُومُ حَتَّى تَطْمَئِنَّ قَائِمًا ثُمَّ تَرْكَعُ حَتَّى تَطْمَئِنَّ رَاكِعًا ثُمَّ تَسْجُدُ حَتَّى تَطْمَئِنَّ سَاجِدًا ثُمَّ جِلِسْ ثُمَّ قُعُدْ حَتَّى تَطْمَئِنَّ قَاعِدًا سَجُدُ Qiyam properly, ruku' properly, standing properly, sujood fully, properly. Take your time. So we have to learn how to pray properly and take our time. And then the third thing that I'll quickly mention, and I'll conclude with this, is understand, learn the meaning, al-ma'na, wa tafsir, wa sharh, lima yu. لِمَا يُقْرَأُ فِي الصَّلَةِ وَلِمَا يُقَالُ فِي الصَّلَةِ What we say, what we read, what we recite within the prayer, learn the meaning of it. Because it's very beautiful, very powerful. Do we, have we studied the meaning, the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha? 
of the surahs we read. Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, Sami Allahu Liman Hamida, Rabbi Alak Al-Hamd, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, At-Tahiyyatu Lillahi wa Salawat. Because otherwise I'm just reading. Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Al-Alamin, Rahman, Rahim, al What does that mean? It means nothing. The Prophet Sallallahu said, La la yujawizu taraqiyahum, hanajirahum. That they'll say the words, but their words will no go, not go down below their throat. It will not reach their heart. So understand what you're saying, and then when you pray, think about the meaning of what you are saying. Reflect on it, connect with it. And if we can do these three things, it will drastically improve our experience of the Salah, so much so that the Prophet ﷺ said what? He said, جُعِلَتْ قُرَّةُ عَيْنِ فِي الصَّلَةِ The coolness of my eyes, my peace, my tranquility, my happiness is found in the Salah. When the Prophet ﷺ would tell Bilal to call the Adhan, he would say, أَرِحْنَا بِهَا يَا Bilal." Let us go and enjoy the prayer. He looked forward to it. Intidaru salati mina salah. Al intidaru lis salati mina salah. Like waiting, longing, looking forward from one salah to the next. And once we unlock that, then all of life becomes easy. Because anytime, Ida hazabahu amrun. Any time difficulty or adversity comes to me, I know that I can always go and talk to Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tranquility and khushu' and quality within our salah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our relationship with Allah, our salah, our means of overcoming the difficulty, the mashakil, the adversities of life. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Jazakumullah khairan. Zakhla Khairan Sheikh Abdul Nasir for joining us tonight out of your very busy schedule and sharing your knowledge with us today. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to bless you with more knowledge so that way you could share that knowledge and get rewarded for it, inshallah. Amen. We started this night with a beautiful recitation of the Quran. We are going to end this night with a beautiful dua led by our Sheikh Naaman Hussain. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Allahumma aghfir al-mu'mineen wa al-mu'minat. Wa al-muslimin wa al-muslimat. Al-ahyai minhum wa al-amwat. Innaka sami'un qaribu mujibu al-da'awat ya rabbil alameen. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وقنا عذاب القبر وقنا عذاب الحشر وقنا عذاب الميزان وأدخلنا الجنة مع الأبرار يا عزيز يا غفار يا رب العالمين اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا وعملا متقبلا ورزقا حلالا طيبا وشفاء من كل داء اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع ومن قلب لا يخشع ومن عين لا تدمع ومن نفس لا تشبع ومن دعاء لا يسمع اللهم إنا نسألك حبك وحب من يحبك وحب عمل يقربني يقربنا إلى حبك Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Kareem, we ask you to honor us all and forgive us all, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, allow this gathering to be a gathering of mercy and elevation for all of us, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you that you allow what we have heard tonight to become a part of our practice, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, we ask you that you allow us to navigate through the challenges and difficulties of life with ease. Allow us to hold on to your words and the message of your Habib, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. O Allah, we ask you for those of us who are struggling that you grant us ease through our struggles. Ya Allah, those of us who are experiencing loss, Ya Allah, we ask you to heal our hearts. O Allah, those of us who are struggling with our faith, O Allah, we ask you to grant us firmness and steadfastness, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, grant us khushu' and concentration in our prayers, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you that you honor us as young people and old people in this world and the hereafter, Ya Allah. Ya Rahman, Ya Kareem, we ask you that you grant us protection from the fitnas and trials and tribulations around us, Ya Allah. 
Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Kareem, we ask you that you forgive us and honor us, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, we ask you that you allow us to be with your Habib Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the hereafter, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, allow him to be pleased with us when he sees us, Ya Allah. Allow him to embrace us when we meet him, Ya Allah. Allow us to drink from his blessed hands when we see him on the day of judgment, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, honor the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and reward him with abundance, Ya Allah, for the sacrifices that he has made for us, Ya Allah. And allow us to repay the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by following his message, Ya Allah. Allow us to honor his word, Ya Allah. Allow us to honor his sunnah, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Kareem, we ask you to grant us all the beautiful things that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would ask for. And O oh Allah, protect us from all the evil that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would seek protection from. Ya Allah, grant us success in all of our affairs of this dunya, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, grant us success in our marriages, Ya Allah. Make our spouse and our children the coolness of our eyes, Ya Allah. Those of us who are are struggling with our marriages, O oh Allah, we ask that you allow us to find peace and tranquility within our marriages, Ya Allah. Allow us to seek help and find guidance for our relationships, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, honor our parents, Ya Allah. Give them a long life with Iman and health, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we make special dua for Sheikh Abdul Nasser's father who passed away recently. O oh Allah, we ask you that you make his grave from the gardens of paradise, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, elevate his status, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, make his grave from the gardens of paradise, Ya Allah. Grant him Jannatul Firdaus without reckoning, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, allow all the good that Shaykh Nas Abdul Nasir does to be in his scales on the Day of Judgment, Ya Allah. Allow it to be a source of coolness for him in his grave, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, those of us who have lost our loved ones and our parents, O oh Allah, we ask you to forgive them and honor them, Ya Allah. And those of our loved ones and parents who are still alive and around, O oh Allah, honor us to serve them and take care of them, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, grant us all the beautiful things of this world and grant us all the success of this world, Ya Allah. And O oh Allah, we ask you that you reunite us all with our loved ones in the highest stages of Jannah, Ya Allah. Ya Rahman, Ya Kareem, whatever desires and thoughts that we are we have in our heart, O oh Allah, you are the one that hears and understands them better than we can articulate them, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, we ask you that you fulfill every single one of our needs, Ya Allah. And O oh Allah, respond to every single one of our call, Ya Allah. Accept our du'as from us, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, accept our call, call our call upon you, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, we ask you that you make us amongst those whose du'as are accepted. رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا يَا مَوْلَانَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَابُ الرَّحِيمُ اللهم إنا نسألك من خير ما سألك منه نبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما استعاذك منه نبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وأنت المستعان وعليك البلاغ ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وصلى الله تعالى على خير خلقه سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين أمين والحمد لله رب العالمين زاكم الله